Climate change is the single largest challenge of our time. It is an existential threat to our survival. So begins the report by the Trade Law and Carbon Pricing Lab at the University of New Brunswick. The report, published in 2022, argues that by implementing carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments, or BCAs, we can and should combat climate change. The challenge is to do so within the context of existing trade law written in the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. UMB law professor Maria Panezzi runs the lab and works with her students to move Canadian policymakers towards implementing BCAs. So going back to the beginning of WTO history, what, what has the GATT provided for us and our economies globally? The whole point of the GATT was to, to limit and potentially eliminate tariffs. And it had a few members at the beginning, but you know, as currently we have 164 member states, it represents more than 99% of international trade volume and more than 99% of the world population. But what are the two main rules? Those would be Articles 1 and 3, so uh, the most favored nation and the national treatment. But very simply, what are those two? They're the non-discrimination rules that you cannot discriminate uh, against other products coming from other countries. And the two faces of this non-discrimination is on one side we have the obligation to treat every country's products the same way with other countries that have the same products. So when, when things are coming into Canada, say from Brazil, and they're coming in from France, if they're identical, then they have to be treated exactly the same at the border. They have to be given exactly the same tariff or, or tax, basically. Uh, or if there are any privileges that somehow are given to one product Th those have to be equalized across the board for all the same products. So that's the most favored nation side of the rule. And then you have the national treatment side of the rule, which only applies after you have something come into your country. And then uh, you cannot treat your own products, your own identical products. Let's say we're talking about apples. You can treat your own apples better than those that you uh, just allowed the import of. So that's the rule that, that essentially is the internal aspect of non-discrimination. So when a country decides to take part in an initiative, whether environmental or otherwise, um, that it affects trade, what are their obligations with regard to other countries in order to avoid a conflict? Uh, so Canada has had the obligation to comply with these rules with respect to its trading partners within the organization. They've had that obligation since 1947. But of course, two things happen in the history of the organization. Both um, uh, the clarification of rules occurs via jurisprudence, right? There's disputes and through those disputes we clarify the rules, we apply them. Countries find loopholes or try to find loopholes to go around those rules. And so through that application, grows a body of law and you already have in the GAD a an article with exceptions. There is an exception for the environment specifically, Article 20G. Most of the conversation surrounding carbon pricing, to the extent that it affects foreign goods, will come to a discussion of Article 20G. And that's where we're at, right? So trying to figure out domestic environmental regulations and to what extent they relate to the GATT and the WTO. So countries shouldn't see WTO law as an obstacle to taking environmental action? Not at all, no, no. And I think there's very good reason to try in good faith to comply. When you look at Article 20, that has the general exceptions uh, heading and looks at policy that can allow uh, swerving from the main rules, Essentially, the spirit is that it's done in a way that's non-discriminatory, even-handed, fair. And part of conveying this fairness and demonstrating that you've taken all the appropriate steps or all the steps that you could to do this in the least impactful way for trade is to actually discuss with your trading partners. Canada is bound by the Paris Agreement of 2015 to meet emissions targets. And one way to encourage this is through carbon taxes and border carbon adjustments. So although it 
Carbon pricing schemes are often called carbon taxes. They're actually not taxes. As uh, people in the field know, this is a regulatory charge. The point isn't to create revenue, like a traditional tax under the constitution. It's to deter carbon emissions. Right. In Canada, right after the Paris Agreement, we come to the beginning of March 2016. And there is a meeting in Vancouver where all the premiers of provinces come together and they sign the Vancouver Declaration. And there they say, we are going to figure a way out to do something about uh, the Paris Agreement and it's going to be carbon pricing and we're going to be putting together a more coordinated response. So again, right, growing pains. There's a lot of that in the laws that were created in order to implement carbon pricing, a lot of discussion. There is, as always, a very healthy pushback in order to make the rules better. People who object to it, companies that object to it, and why they object. And I do believe there needs to be popular support, mm -hmm. right? If you want it to work, you can't be constantly implementing by enforcement. You also have to have some voluntary buy-in. Do you see it as a potential problem in litigation? There can be many reasons why we end up in court. It could be that the rules need to be tailored further, but long story short, it survives the Supreme Court challenge. And now we have carbon pricing everywhere. One of the biggest problems with carbon pricing is carbon leakage. Why don't we define the concept of, of carbon leakage? Once you have carbon pricing legislation in one jurisdiction or any type of measures that are intended to limit carbon emissions overall, companies will no longer find um, cheap to buy the same products they were buying before. So let's say that you have a builder whose building is building using steel for the windows or whatever, and suddenly the Canadian steel, being one of the larger emitters, is more expensive. So while the Canadian economy can find itself um, carbon accountable and mostly clean and gravitate away from carbon intensive methods because they don't want to be priced anymore. Canadian consumers will still buy things that were produced elsewhere with high carbon intensity and without having been accountable because they're just cheaper. It's just cheaper to do it that way. That's the whole point of leakage. Suddenly the carbon is not here, it's being emitted somewhere else. And this begs the question, what is really the, the re real concern about carbon leakage? Can these manufacturers really pick up everything and go elsewhere? Right. Especially when we're talking about fossil fuels. The resources are in the ground. Are, in the ground. are they really going to go elsewhere? Right, so just doing it in one country will actually not do much given how interconnected we are in international trade. But doing the same thing for your imports and doing it everywhere, finding the big economies to embrace the border carbon adjustment as an option in addition to a domestic carbon pricing will make consumers go to the less carbon intensive product. And as consumers are changing their preferences, the hope is that investment changes for BCAs to be legal, they cannot be used to subsidize domestic producers, as this is incompatible with WTO rules. Why are subsidies so important in the, in the way that they overlap with carbon border adjustments? It's because the moment you put that tax in place, people want a break. And that break will most likely be a subsidy because it applies to everyone else and it doesn't apply to you and it's assistance. Those types of tax breaks, they're subsidies. And that essentially renders that tax meaningless. Some industries have what are known as free emissions credits that are given to high carbon emitters. This can cause some issues. In the Canadian context, there are lower thresholds for the highest emitters, which doesn't really do much right. for changing the economy's direction towards greener energy. It's like we're telling them, if you decide to be carbon intensive, just make sure you're very carbon intensive. And it's definitely not the right messaging. The idea of taxation is to create revenue in order to be able to, to fund different activities in the economy. And that's not what we're doing here. We have something that 
essentially is very costly in ways that we don't see. And we're trying to rectify that by putting an actual price on it. So you don't see W2 law as an obstacle for the encouragement of renewable energy. If you just look at WTO law itself, there's nothing there to prevent a renewable energy platform so long as it's non-discriminatory. It's perfectly okay if folks understand this as a tax, and maybe for now it can act as one, but eventually the point is to transition into a type of economy and type of activities that will make this completely unnecessary. We will try to be absolutely green in, in a more organic way. We must reframe how we understand these laws to address our current climate crisis. By opening our minds to the possibilities of trade law, we become more creative lawmakers and can actualize positive change in the economy and the environment, making us all more carbon accountable as consumers and as corporations. By thoroughly engaging with the GATT, we can understand more deeply its limitations and restrictions, but also what is possible. This, we hope, will create a collective solution for a collective problem.